great book written, Steal Like an Artist. If you steal from one person, it's theft. If you steal from many people, it's called innovation, right? <laughs> um, and... Hi, I'm Matt Eagle, the host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders who are looking to drive improvement in their customer experience and culture together. I'm excited to be here today with Rob Krugman, who's the Chief Digital Officer of Broadridge. Thanks for being here today, Rob. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to the conversation. Absolutely. Um, now, you're in the thick of things in the fintech space. So I'm really excited to talk today about some of the innovations in the space and the impact and they're having on the customer experience and, and things like AI and other digital innovations. Absolutely. I think there is, uh, you know, I always joke that the financial services industry and fintech got kind of boring for a little bit there in kind of the mid 2000s where everyone wanted to go work for Google and Amazon and Facebook and do really interesting things. And then all of a sudden, you know, last two or three years, fintech's exciting. It's the place to be. So a lot of a lot of good uh, innovation happening and a lot of interesting technology. Very cool. Well, thanks for sharing some of your experience with the audience today. I guess just to kick us off here, uh, what do you see as some of the ways that fintech innovations are most impacting the customer experience? You know, I, I believe that organizations are starting to recognize that uh, the experience is what really matters to consumers. They have more choices than they've ever had. You know, the, it's, it's hard to say that the internet is a new thing. It's been around for many years, but the reality is it's much easier to switch than it ever has been. So if you start to, if you use that as your mantra and you start to focus on what you need to do, you need to satisfy the needs of the customer. And more often than not today, that finds its way through customer experience is how does my app work? How does my website work? How are the interactions? How do I eliminate friction in the process so that I enable people to work with me, get what they need to get done as quickly as possible, and they go on with the rest of their day. So a lot of people, when they talk about customer experience, they talk about the easy button, about you know how to improve, you just talked about reducing friction, about how, how to make the, the, uh, it easier to do business, whether it's with a consumer or with another business. What, what, how do you think about um, ease of doing business in, in, with some of these new digital opportunities? You know, I, you hit it right. There's a there's a meme that's gone around for many years and it shows the Apple interface and there is a, there's a single button on the screen and then it shows the Google interface and there's a single search box. I'm sure you've seen it. And then it says your interface and there's 15 dials and 47 different input boxes and screens and different places to input information. I think that organizations are starting to recognize that's not really a good way to do business, right? How do I simplify these interactions and how do I build it from the perspective of that end consumer? So I think this design thinking revolution, which started probably 10 years ago, is really starting to come into the forefront of let's stop building tools based upon the way our business operates. Let's start building tools based upon the way our customers want to operate with us. And, you know, it sounds similar, but I think that small adjustment drives significant value and reduces the friction very quickly. Absolutely. It's called the customer journey for a reason, right? You're, you're putting yourself in the customer's shoes and walking on their journey uh, with them to really understand um, the, the experience from their lens. And, and sometimes there's some cumulative, like in tennis, lots of small changes can have a big impact, Yep. right? And the same thing's true in business. I call them the brilliant basics. You, you know, you, you want the brilliant basics. You also want some of the bold bets, some of the bigger innovations, but a lot of the brilliant basics can have a really significant impact on, on uh, customer experience and ease of doing business is one of the, one of the ways. Yeah, it's funny, you know, many years ago, I worked in the consulting industry and, uh, you know, the term customer experience management started to kind of come up in like the late nineties, early two thousands. And it's, this stuff's not rocket science, right? You take out, you define what those flows are. And you very quickly can identify where the friction in those flows exists for your customers. And if you squash those, the impact can be immediate. I think the other aspect is that one of the beauties of design is that we can design around workflows and systems that may not operate the way that we want them to, right? So you think about, you know, the significance of kind of the API revolution and making it easier to access backend platforms. We can hide a lot of the spaghetti and the challenges that exist behind the scenes from the customer by actually creating a very, very simple interface. And it may not work exactly the way it's, that they think it works, but that's okay. And you, know, you think, about, think about Venmo and financial services, right? I think if you ask most people who use Venmo, 
they think money is moving real time, right? Behind the scenes, we know that's actually not the case. We know that actually there's an end of day process that settles and clears the money. But for the individual, they're sending $50 to their friend after dinner or $100 and it's moving real time. And that's really all they care about. What you're talking about, I mean, just to kind of step back and unpack it a little for the audience is some of the significant impacts that low code and no code are having and more modular approaches to the technology architecture and the data. So that, you know, you take Uber as an example. It's Google Maps location, you know, and, and the, a lot of the stuff that it's doing, we're riding on others' rails. And there, there's a lot of things that companies can do where they design experiences now where they can either leverage others' technology or they can use platforms for low-code development where there's a lot less coding required and the, the, this, the experiences are like Lego bricks that are being snapped together. And you know what, what's interesting about that is think about where we are, right? It's 2024. Um, we just kind of went through, I think what we could all agree would be the year of AI's kind of coming out party where all of a sudden this technology hit us like, uh, I don't think anything we've seen in probably 20 or 30 years. Think about how tools like Figma, a design application is going to be able to integrate AI so that designers can create interfaces and press a button and those interfaces come to life in HTML and different types of code platforms. It's pretty exciting to think about how we're going to be able to put these tools together moving forward. But you're absolutely right. The, the basis for a lot of this are small modules, small little components that can easily be built on top of each other and that we can kind of plug them together in the appropriate way to satisfy unique journeys, not just kind of generic journeys. What's interesting about this is you can have um, some things that move really fast, you know, the speedboat approach, more agile. And other things, maybe you want to take a slower approach, more risk averse, more hardened, and both can coexist in the same company. And the key is to figure out where there are the opportunities to be more agile and drive ahead and, and not let everything be like a three to five year journey to, to build something out where, the, where the, the things that take more time slow everything else down. It, you know, it, it's funny that you say that because I, I often think about like, what are the, the big technical drivers behind delivering the best possible experience for customers? And in, in my head, you know, there's a number of different pieces, but where it started with was this idea of open platforms. Instead of, to your point of, let's not recreate all these legacy applications, let's unlock them. Let's unlock them through services that people can then build upon. And then we can take more time recreating those backend platforms to be more efficient and drive the right value. On top of that, you know, then we have you know, the robust world of design where we can create all different types of aspects and capabilities. And then you know, increasingly the integration of AI to help us make decisions more effectively. And instead of you know, creating an interface that's hard-coded towards a specific set of steps, allow us to actually convert those steps and leverage AI engines to be able to determine what information should be asked for next versus having a predefined path for everyone because not everyone's the same. So I'm going to walk through the AI door you just opened. I think it was only a matter of minutes before we would talk <laughs> about AI. Um, what do you... You know, what do you see as some of the uh, most fertile opportunities that AI is opening up? You just talked a little bit about next best action. I mean, there's so many applications, but what are what do you, what do you see as the promise of AI, and and where should people be focused mo more of their attention? So here's going to be a little bit of my inner nerdness is going to pop out now. Where I get really excited is we've been doing a lot of work uh, for the last several years around thinking about DLT and blockchain technology. Right. And if you want to talk about impact of financial services, if you think about that technology being able to provide huge efficiencies in the way that we clear and settle trades, banking transactions, all different types of financial metrics. Now you add AI in there. Right. And you teach AI engines to make decisions. The ability of the industry to move from what is largely an end of day based process today to real time decision making, I don't think. In our lifetimes, we're going to see such an impact happen because it's going to completely transform the way we think about financial services and the ability to execute transactions. And it's going to have regulatory effect and disclosure effect and compliance effect. It's going to change a lot of things. On the front end, from an experiential perspective, what it's going to mean is it's going to make it easier for people to participate in the financial ecosystem. And then the way that they participate, 
um, I think is going to change quite a bit. And so let me give you an example, right? If we think about something like KYC and AML, right, which is such a cornerstone of the way finance works, where you need information about an individual before you can allow them access to financial products. The, it's really complicated. It's expensive. It takes a long time. And there's a notion out there that says, you know, the people that want to do bad are going to find their way around it. And often what the result is, is that the people that are trying to do the right thing get caught up in this and they, they can't access the right services. They can't get through the right tools. Well, if we start to think about the use of AI and ML in that particular area, it's fascinating, right? Could an ML engine be looking for anomalies real time, call out anomalies as they happen? And when they do, ask both sides to provide information about themselves real time instead of having to do all that work up front, right? That's some of the promise. And if you think about that from a customer experience perspective, it makes it much easier, right? It's, instead of having to show your license before you get on the expressway or freeway, you know, when you do something wrong, that's when you show your license to prove that you actually have, you know, a license to drive. So it changes the model. And I think the industry is going to have to kind of grasp with those changes because it's going to make it much more efficient. So to play this back, I think what I'm hearing is the financial services experiences have a lot of uh, decisions and judgment and information that needs to be processed. One point you made, Rob, is we can streamline and optimize the way those decisions get made throughout the day that would not only allow faster you know, experiences for people, but would allow us to gather a lot more information that would allow us to tailor the experience and also manage risks, right? And then in addition, we can, because of the technology, because of the flexibility you have with an AI-powered experience, you could actually reimagine the way that experience is done uh, to take advantage of some of the information and, and, and analytics that's available. You just said it a lot better than I did. I think that, you know, providing people with the information that they need based upon the use case they're trying to um, apply versus providing people with an infinite amount of information because it's easier to do it that way today, right? So it's going to unlock these experiences. And I think, you know, it, you think about banking and capital markets, but you're going to be able to apply this to mortgages and, you know, credit cards and other types of transactions that we do that um, it just makes it easier for people to understand what they're being asked to do, why they're being asked to do that, and allowing them to get started in a much more efficient way. And efficiency, you know, usually means that reduction in costs behind the scenes. Yeah. And to come back to our point about modularity, you can break down the opportunities into smaller chunks and solve them. You don't have to solve all of this at once. You can, you know, isolate pieces of the experience and improve it and work your way across it over time in, in modules rather than try to change everything all at once. I think absolutely, that's 100% spot on. And it, it really starts with, it also speaks to why it's so important for organizations to be creating open models, right? Whether you plan on exposing all of your services as APIs that people can build on or not, by creating open models and approaches towards connecting to technology and data and facilitating transactions, and then tying that to kind of an enterprise approach towards design, where you're actually doing a similar thing, a modularization of the design, so you're not continually rebuilding the same component over and over and over again uh, per use case. Um, it's very, very exciting. A lot of this requires data, um, you know, for the AI ultimately to uh, basically what AI is often doing is it's either synthesizing and summarizing or it's personalizing and tailoring the experience based on data. Yep. Right. So, you know, that's leading a lot of companies to invest in their data you know, building more first party data, building the ability for data sets to be integrated and more work together. Um, what do you see as some of the, you know, leading practices or lesson learned for companies as they invest in more of their uh, data assets to enable this? You know, I, I think there is one of the problems with data that often comes up is compliance and legal rights and how you're actually going to use that information. And I, I believe that one of the things we're starting to see if you think about what happened in the UK with GDPR and then California with the California Consumer Privacy Act, there is a there is a new proposal up in the US government that would provide protections for every American in regards to the use of their data. And I think best practices are starting to teach us to separate out 
PII information from all the other data that we have about customers and keeping that PII data locked someplace else. And then just using information about the customer's accounts, the customer's habits, other data that we can actually use and not attributing that to the individual, but actually using it separately. That's like step number one is how do we separate out the data? Because when you do that, then you can do lots of things with that information, right? To your point, you could feed it into AI models and engines to be able to create desirable um, outcomes. One of the things that I'm very excited about is that, you know, while this was a year of gen AI, I think behind the scenes, there's also a lot of work going on around creating models for structured information. And structured information, which is really not, you know, what gen AI has been built for, it's really that's more generating content. These structured mo uh, models are able to actually do predictive analytics at a level that we've never seen before. So imagine being able to take in information about consumer behavior or, or about account movements across your entire firm, feeding that in and actually being able to predict what we think the future is by running millions of simulations in a few seconds uh, versus having to build all of that stuff is, is fascinating to me. So I think from a data perspective, it's creating that, how do we create the proper data governance? And then once we have the data governance, how do we unlock the information so that it's accessible to folks so we can use it for these different purposes and probably in a way that we're not creating multiple copies of the information over and over again, you know? You know, one thing I just want to build on for what you were saying, Rob, are the, the, um, this um, opportunity to actually um, create new data synthesizing across some of the other data. You were talking about observing the behaviors. Uh, Yogi Berra uh, said something once that I really love, which is you observe a lot by watching. Um, and that, you know, I think you can actually learn a lot about customers' preferences and interests based on what they do. Uh, you know, the, the behavioral data data is often what you're gleaning from your interactions with them, not some data that you're buying from a third party. Uh, so some of the most valuable data, I'm not saying you wouldn't want to integrate third party data sets, but some of the most valuable data assets are actually not fully leveraged at many companies, which is to take the signals that are available from the behaviors of the customers and synthesize that and create new data, uh, about about their customers. And that's actually one of the more powerful things I find with AI now is that you can actually synthesize not only behavioral data in your systems, but also sentiment like social media, call centers, messaging. Uh, you can take those conversations and actually create synthetic data variables that you can combine with other data signals, which actually help your predictive analytics that you were talking about. I also think, you know, one of the coolest things when you start playing with AI, you just hit on it, is the ability to create data immediately. Create me a table that has this information based upon this information. And you're like, it's almost like a magic that happens behind the scenes where all of a sudden now you have all this information that you could start to leverage. But I, I, I do agree with you. I, you know, One of the challenges that I think a lot of organizations have when it comes to customer experience is that you know, they speak to people and they, you know, they take those answers to be the gospel. But to your point, watching is so much more informative, right? I, I've always joked, I, I, you know, I speak in front of college students a lot. And one of the questions I often try this little tech where I ask them questions around the security of information and data um, and how important it is. And everyone always said, for example, security of my information is the most important thing in the world. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And then you challenge by actually asking questions about what they do. And what it almost always demonstrates, simplicity and lack of friction trumps everything, right? So while people will kind of highlight that this is a concern or that is a concern, watching their behavior and how they truly interact with capabilities is where you really get some of your best learnings because, you know, in some cases they are in sync. What you heard from someone is what they actually do, but in a lot of cases they're not, and you can learn so much more from watching. We're actually hardwired for simplicity. The way the human brain works we crave ease. We crave friction. Like 95% of decision-making is unconscious. And what, that, what does that mean? It means we build habit loops. It means we do what we've learned works. And we're doing that because there's no friction. It's expedient in a good way. And like we don't have to spend as much effort to process information. So that's what loyalty is, actually. It's a learned behavior that works for you, right? And 
and and when when if you create an experience that is easy you build habit behaviors and if you create friction people slow down and they evaluate that's what think slow is so good experience design plays into human nature you know you want to make things easy for people when and you think about the outside influences i you know i think most organizations get this but there are there are still many organizations that don't that you are no longer competing against your competitors you're now competing against apple and Google and Amazon, right? So when I, I, when I order a product at nine o'clock in the morning today from Amazon and it's delivered in my house by 1230 in the afternoon and it hurts my head a little bit to think about how that actually happened, but it's really exciting when it does. When you then go and order a product from a company that's not Amazon and it takes six days, you're furious, right? It, it, and so to your point, the, these outside influences impact in such a great way. And one of the ones that we often use, right, we're, we're a big communications company. We help a lot of our clients communicate. And one of the examples we use is the credit card experience for, for Apple Card. Um, and I don't know if everyone has a version of the Apple Card. And we could talk about the success of the Apple Card program and whether it, put all that stuff aside for a second. The experience of signing up for that card is like unlike anything I have ever done in my entire life. It took less than a few, maybe less than a minute for me to get pre-approved from my card directly through my, you know, my phone that's always in my pocket. I automatically had access to credit. I had, I have two college students that were doing something and they're like, dad, we need your credit card for number for this. And I said, you know what? Let me just give you access to a credit card. And I added them to my account and they got a credit card real time. They've eliminated almost a hundred percent of the friction from the process. And now every other bank whether they understand this or not, is playing catch up against this wonderful experience that Apple's built integrated into their phones of how I pay and how I do different types of activities. So I think that, you know, organizations that are totally insular in the way that they think, they're not going to be successful in the long term. You have to be thinking about what are the other experiences your customers are dealing with every single day from companies that may have nothing to do what you do but if they have this wonderful experience with the utility company or this wonderful experience with the airline, they're going to expect exactly the same experience from you. And if you don't deliver, they're going to look for someone who does. I think this can have a very positive impact on innovation and experience. Um, you know, great innovation is combining existing things in new ways. Yeah. That's what artists do. That's what innovators do. They're, you know, there's a, a great book written, Steal Like an Artist. If you steal from one person, it's theft. If you steal from many people, it's called innovation, right? <laughs> um, and, um, you know, I think that that actually is a very powerful concept that if you can open up your thinking to outside influences, then you get past kind of narrow business, think in the box mindset. And there are actually ways you can encourage people to open up and get exposed to that's a good strategy, good design process actually looks for outside in, in, inspiration, and then looks then looks for how to apply it to your business. If you start with yourself and you start insular, you end up with small incremental improvements, very narrow changes. But if you start asking what are the right questions, what are the right outside inspirations, what have others done to solve this problem, you're more likely to get a breakthrough thinking. And I think this some of the recognition people have that that other industries and other people have because they see the Amazon, Apple or or other other companies that have driven innovation. They're looking for more outside inspiration now. And I think we'll see acceleration of innovation as a result. I agree. I mean, if you think about financial services, financial services takes inspiration from the retail market. Right. And the first place it lands usually is banking because we all need to bank. Right. So I always joke that if you think about innovation in finance, it starts in the banking industry, and then several years later, it makes its way to the capital markets and brokerage industry trading. And then several years later, it makes its way to the insurance sector, right? That's kind of the way things have typically worked from an experiential perspective. And to your point, you know, there's so many places we can look for ideas and concepts that are working in, you know, not our industry, but in other industry and take those ideas and then leverage them and think about how we can deliver something similar here. It's a great place to start because it makes the innovation process much easier because a lot of the work around acceptance and behavioral change has already been completed by somebody else. I'm personally very interested in this idea of how 
culture and behavior impact customer experience? I'd love to get your, you know, you're, you're just touched on it yourself there. What do you see as the connection between customer experience and culture? There's a huge one. And so I think one of the challenges that innovation ha- with innovation within large organizations is that people don't understand that connection. And so, you know, someone inside an organization comes up with an idea. Wouldn't it be great if we could do this because it's going to generate more revenue or it's going to provide efficiencies, right? And so we're a B2B company. B2B to C is what we typically refer to ourselves, but it also B2C, it doesn't matter. When we come up with ideas like that, internal ideas are going to be beneficial to us. The likelihood of them being successful is much lower than when we flip the script and we start the other direction, right? So let's start with the behavior and culture, right? What problem are we actually trying to solve for that end user, right? What's the impact of that change? Is it, is it really a problem for them or not, right? And if it is a problem, how do we simplify that problem for them? Because if we do that, the likelihood of us solving our challenge and generating new opportunities for us is much greater than if we simply implement something because it's good for us. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think the, the um, buy-in to change, you know, people need to be ready for the change um, and you need to help them understand like what, what's in it for them or how their lives can be different. There need to be some hook about why they want to change. Otherwise it's very hard to get change to occur. Let me give you, I'll give you a real world example. So, you know, one of the things that Broadridge does as an organization is we help our clients communicate with their customers. We send out brokerage statements and bills and other types of information. And, you know, while I think most people would expect that the vast majority of that content is digital, the reality is a lot of it is still sent physically through the U.S. Postal Service. And so, you know, internally, wouldn't it be great if we could get everyone to accept the delivery? And our clients, wouldn't it be great if everyone accept? we're going to mandate that they accept the delivery? Well, if you flip the model around and you start with that end customer in mind and you ask them, why are you not adopting electronic delivery? The answer becomes obvious, right? It's an experiential answer. And I'll kind of explain what we've heard as we've done our analysis. In a physical experience, it takes me about 15 seconds a day to walk to my mailbox, open it up, look at what's there, keep what's important and throw out what's not. And I quickly can then go and pay my bills online at my bank or do whatever actions are required. So let me understand this. You want me to replace that experience, which literally takes seconds a day with this experience. I'm going to send you a cryptic email with a link in it. That link is going to bring you to a website where you have to renumber a username and password. And if you haven't registered, you have to create a a username and password. You're then going to be brought into a website. You have to go find the actual communication that was sent to you and then take that communication and take action. So that action may be that you then go to your bank to pay the bill. It may be that you actually read the information. And so what you have is a massive drop off of the number of people that actually take those steps. So how do you solve for that? Right? You solve for that through experience. You flip the dialogue and you actually go and speak to individuals and you say, what is most important to you? It's like, I want to know what I need to know right now, right? If I need to pay something, tell me how much I have to pay and where to pay it so I can do it. If it's a brokerage account, tell me what's happened and how much money I've made and how I'm doing in my account. And if you flip that dialogue and then you focus on how do we actually create an experience that's superior to the physical experience, that's how you drive digital engagement and digital adoption. But the, the, it really starts with an understanding of what actions are you trying to solve for your customer? And then by solving those actions for your customer, what benefit does that provide to me as an organization? Too often it starts with what benefit could this get for me as an organization? And then let's figure out what it means to the customer. And that's why things don't work. I agree, Rob. A lot of companies approach even the phrase digital containment. Well, when people, what is digital containment? Why do p- banks and healthcare companies use this phrase? They're trying to contain a call, prevent, to keep the experience digital so that it doesn't move back into the physical world. Digital containment means that you get all the way through with it staying digital instead of ending up with a person involved or on a phone, right? Yeah. Um, And it it kind of betrays a inside out mindset versus outside in mindset. What we really want is is an improved experience for the customer where digital created more value for the customer than before rather than containing them in a digital experience. In some cases, physical might be the right experience for that particular customer, right? So I think there's 
you, we, we started with AI. Let's go back to that a little bit here where, you know, I think AI is going to simplify this because the ability to not have a set script, but to be able to actually speak to folks through digital channels in an effective way where it could actually drive the conversation in a lot of different avenues is a, obviously very welcome. And I think that'll help. I think the, the other interesting piece here is going to be, you know, it's that omni-channel. It's, it's, it's how, do, how do we move between these, these two different worlds or these two different areas seamlessly so that people get an experience that they're comfortable with? And one of the ones that we're really interested in is around identity. I, I, I would say that, you know, anyone who does not believe identity is broken, I, I would actually suggest is wrong. The way that we think about identity in a digital world um, is that you have relationships. I think the last I read, the average individual has 250 online relationships, which in theory means 250 different usernames and um, password pairs, um, though probably people are reusing them over and over again, which has all types of security issues. We need to move to a place where consumers control their own identity, right? And who issues that identity? It could be in some countries, it's going to be the federal government, like India has done a lot of work around this. In some places, the US, it's probably not going to be the federal government. Maybe it's the bank. Right. I know a lot of the big tech have tried to actually implement this, but I think there's a trust factor there. But think about that world and where we could go, where a consumer has an identity that they control with information about themselves that they define and has been validated by others. And they can then use that to basically connect with third parties in a hundred percent frictionless way where they determine what information they want to share with this third party. And then that third party is able to give them benefits based upon what information is shared. So if you want to really reduce friction, you give a lot of information. Um, if you as a, cons as a consumer says, you know what, I'm not too sure yet. I want to actually take my way through this very slowly. Let's start with my first name and then let's go to this other pieces of information you need as I get more comfortable with this experience. I think that if you think about the term Web3, and we we've been thinking a lot about the term Web3 and financial services, it kind of goes towards crypto. But the idea of the consumer taking back control over their data is such an exciting thing moving forward for financial services and really every other industry because the consumer now controls how far they want to interact with an individual organization, how much information they want to give, and they could do a much better job of controlling the dialogue moving forward. Makes a lot of sense. I mean, we've been hearing about the consumer being in control for a couple of decades, you know, when the... Uh, but there's so many more ways that it's prevalent today, and we're really seeing it come, come, come. You know, it's accelerating. It's really a revolution in the way we think about data. We've talked about data governance a little bit. Imagine how attractive it is as an organization if you no longer have to be responsible for the storing and the custody, if you will, of the underlying data about your customers. But your customer actually is responsible for that. They make decisions as far as what information that they're going to share with you and how that information is going to be used. And that builds a contract um, where if they're going to provide you with this information, you're going to provide them with a specific service. And by the way, Mr. Service Provider, Mr. Company, Mrs. Company, if you don't provide that service, I can take back that information and you no longer can actually service me. So I think it actually gets us to a, a really, really positive place where it's going to provide huge benefit to the individual. But at the same time, it's going to provide arguably larger benefit to these organizations because their cost of data governance and compliance and all these other things could go down and the experience that they could deliver could be increased based upon, you know, the customer they're interacting with. I'd like to um, kind of recap some of the themes that we've hit on, Rob, just to um, for the audience. I think it's really powerful. And, uh, you know, some of the themes you've been hitting on about how to uh, create a better adoption cycle for new digital experiences. That's what I'm hearing. There, some of, if you want, if you have a new digital experience and want to get people to adopt it, one theme I heard is actually make sure you start with the user and understand why the experience is going to be better in digital than in, they had before. Uh, if we don't start with the with design thinking, start with the user, we're not going to end up with an experience that's better and we're, and we're not going to be successful at driving the adoption cycles. That was one theme I heard. Another one w was um, keep it really simple. Don't overcomplicate it. Make it really simple. Uh, third was actually put them in control. 
give them the perception of control reality of control wherever possible where they can as they improve trust with you they give you more they 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 they, they reduce friction it's a, it's a, it's a value exchange where they're they're willing to share data in order to get more control or to to reduce friction did i miss anything no, I, I think that's right on. And I think then you have a bunch of technical enablers that are going to facilitate this happening, whether it's AI, blockchain and DLT and changes in identity. And, you know, I expect over the next few years, we're going to have to see a massive um, change in, in the way we think about these things. But I think the other side is there's probably going to be a regulatory compliance capability here, too, where I think that, you know, regulators across a variety of different industries are really going to have to begin to understand how these technologies impact the regulations that already exist so that they can become modifying them to take advantage of these new features and these new ways of thinking. Because right now we've built a model which says the service provider, the company, is really responsible for everything. And I think as we move forward, you know, this idea of a shared model where um, the consumer actually may be responsible for certain things and it's those connections and how do we protect for those connections and where they come together um, where there's going to be significant value generated and it's going to unlock huge amounts of innovation because what's going to be a bank in the future? What's going to be a broker? What's going to, I think as APIs and open platforms, people are going to be able to create all different types of interesting things. And we're already starting to see that with tools like Plaid and, um, and other platforms behind the scenes facilitating so many interesting activities. So as the, the chief digital officer at Broadridge, what are some of the areas that you're most focused on these days? Where are you spending your time? So a few different things. You know, you know, we continue as an organization to think about how do we open our platforms and make them accessible through services, data, and transactional capabilities. And I think lots of organizations are going through that. We've been thinking a lot recently about um, around digital assets. Right. And I, I always joke that the, you know, the rumors of the demise of the crypto industry have been greatly exaggerated. An industry which seemed to be left for uh, for death about 18 months ago has doubled in market cap in the last year. And there's renewed interest kind of globally on putting in the right regulatory frameworks and structures to facilitate this. And that's on the crypto side. The other side of this, which is, you know, often not talked about or not discussed is the massive investments that the financial services industry is making using DLT and blockchain technology to reimagine the back office and middle office systems that really drive the industry forward. And what that's going to mean for consumers is going to mean real-time access, real-time clearing and settlement, and then open services, which is going to create a whole lot of new innovation on top of it. So that's kind of what we've been working on. And then the other that's kind of from a digital transformation perspective. The other area where I spend a lot of time is thinking about innovation. And, you know, obviously AI and, and other tools are things where we're exploring and we're trying to kind of understand what does the future of financial services look like for our clients and for their customers as we're able to take advantage of these technologies and create new forms of content. And one of the things that I'll tell you really excites me is this idea of, you know, hyper, hyper personalization. The utilization of AI to move away from thinking about experiences and in the form of segments to moving or, or profiles and moving towards experiences that have been uniquely created for the actual individual. We've always talked about it, but the actual application and implementation of that was very, very difficult. Well, AI makes it much simpler um, and the technology still needs to grow and it will, right? I, I was in a conference the other day where someone said, the worst AI is ever going to be is today and right tomorrow it's going to be better and the day after that it's going to be better and the day after that's going to be better and I think that's going to kind of you know at least for at least the next few years it's going to kind of be true every single day it's going to get stronger I really love this idea of micro segments that you just hit on Rob that I think there's a a false trade off that we're able to get past which is in the past people used to think that um design thinking was a more creative driven approach where you had personas and you'd build insights about them. And it was very hard to scale that and apply it across the broader business because how did you build data about them? How did you find the people? How did you act on it? It became more of a design tool than something to help run and drive your business with. So it was very useful for design thinking and for strategy and for creative work, but it was hard to, to scale across your business. And the other end of the extreme, you have something that's much more data-driven 
that allows you to thin slice segments, allows you to drive a lot more analytically driven approaches, and you had two different camps. What's exciting now is you can actually create micro segments against your personas. You can actually design personas and create data that allows you to, to, to work to smaller and smaller audiences within personas. So you can have a big, big picture view and then zoom in to have, you know, instead of four or five personas, thousands of micro segments against your personas using AI to optimize experience. And then using analytics, as you hit on earlier, be able to identify, whoa, wait a second. We thought this person fit into this particular area. They don't, right? They just look what right. they just did. This is very different. Something happened and that anomaly then becomes an opportunity, right? If you think about in finance, anomalies in consumer behavior almost always represent opportunity, right? So someone has their first child, um, right? That's an opportunity to provide more wealth services and kind of get them thinking about things differently. Um, you know, there, there's obviously negative ones like sickness and, and health um, that obviously have an effect. but you know, someone got a new job and they're all of a sudden making more money. Wait a second, there's something going on here. Let's follow this a little bit further. There may be an opportunity to kind of create new products and services that satisfies this type of customer. So I think you're absolutely right. It's, it's taking these two things that have really been on opposite ends of the uh, spectrum, putting them together and then using tools like machine learning and, to identify anomalies and then using AI to help in the decision-making process, um, you know, before it was science fiction, it was really hard to think about how we would actually do that. And it was very complicated work. I think today the tools are getting better and better by the day that, you know, what we can imagine um, is not just going to be feasible, it's going to be implementable very quickly. Thank you for your time, Rob. It's been fantastic to have you on the podcast. We could go on for a lot longer and I would really enjoy that. Um if there are particular areas that people want to get in touch with you, like wh what are, what do you think are some of the areas that you'd like to have conversations about? And, you know, what's the best way for people to reach out? Yeah. So, I mean, a few areas come to mind. I think that there is, you know, AI is obviously something that everyone's talking about and, and we're talking a lot about it. So I'd love to kind of get people's ideas and understandings about that. I think, you know, the utilization of blockchain um, and then the crypto industry is an area that we're, you know, very, very focused on. And identity is something I spend a lot of time thinking about because I do think identity has the ability to unlock huge amounts of value um, across kind of the digital universe. I, in, you know, easy to get in touch with me. Um, you know, my LinkedIn profile is Robert Krugman. Uh, my Twitter is Rob Krugman. And, um, you know, my, my email address is, is rob.krugman at broadridge.com. So, uh, very easily accessible. Love talking to people and hearing about new ideas. Rob, it's been great chatting. You sparked a lot of great ideas for me. I know you have for the audience too. Thanks again for your time today. Thanks so much for having me. I really enjoyed the conversation.